How's it going, everybody? Daner here with North Central Coins, and welcome back to another episode of the most rare and valuable coins in Canada. Today, we're going to be counting down the top five most valuable Canadian dimes you can find in your pocket change that, if identified correctly, can be worth some insane amounts of money. Even though these aren't your average pieces of currency, just about anyone can find these coins if you do know what to look for. And in this video, we will explore the historical context surrounding the production of these holy grail coins and delve into why they hold such importance in Canadian numismatic history. Additionally, we will discuss any distinguishing features, their significance among collectors, and also potential value if you are ever to find a legitimate example. Before I do get into this, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new content as it is being released. And make sure to stay to the end of the video if you would like to find out which is the most rare and valuable Canadian dime that you can find. And then without further ado, what do you say we get right into it and break down my picks? for the top five most valuable Canadian dimes. Let's get it, guys. In the year 1968, Canada underwent a significant change in the composition of its 10 cent coins, commonly known as dimes. The Minister of Finance at the time reported that due to a critical shortage of coins in Canada, he had authorized the minting of 75 million 10 cent coins in the United States. This decision was made because the Canadian Mint was fully stretched in addressing the shortage of quarters and was unable to meet the additional production requirements for 10 cent pieces. The difficult task of switching the composition from Canadian coinage from silver to nickel likely prompted the government to seek external assistance and the United States Mint was contracted to produce a substantial quantity of 10 cent coins. This move was only a temporary measure to alleviate the pressing need for circulating currency in Canada. One significant aspect of the 1968 Canadian dimes is the change in composition. Before 1968, Canadian dimes, along with some other denominations including quarters and half dollars were primarily made of silver. However, as a cost-saving measure and due to the rising price of silver, the composition of Canadian dimes was switched from silver to nickel in the year 1968. This change also had a noticeable impact on the appearance and metal content of the coins. The switch to nickel composition for Canadian dimes in 1968 marked a broader trend in many countries moving away from silver coins due to economic considerations. The new composition provided a more cost-effective alternative while still maintaining the functionality of the coins in daily transactions. The decision to authorize the minting of these Canadian dimes in the United States and the shift in composition from silver to nickel in 1968 were driven by practical considerations and economic factors reflecting the changing landscape of currency production during that time. Now let's discuss how to identify and differentiate between the Ottawa and Philadelphia 1968 Canadian dimes. The reading on the side of a coin which consists of raised vertical edges is a distinct feature that can be used to identify and differentiate between coins minted in different facilities. In the case of the 1968 Canadian dimes, those struck at the Philadelphia Mint and Ottawa Mint can be distinguished by examining the characteristics of the reading. The dimes minted at the Philadelphia Mint, the reading will typically exhibit shorter notches that are spread farther apart. This means that the vertical ridges on the edge of the coin are shorter in length and the spaces between them are wider when compared to dimes struck at the Canadian Mint. Dimes struck at the Ottawa Mint feature larger notches in the reading and these notches are spread closer together. This results in longer and more closely spaced vertical ridges on the edge of the coin. The specific arrangement and length of the reading serve as a distinctive hallmark for coins produced at the Royal Canadian Mint. By examining the reading pattern, numismatists and collectors can identify the mint of origin for a given 1968 Canadian dime, distinguishing between those struck at the Philadelphia Mint and those minted in Ottawa. This level of detail adds an additional layer of nuance for individuals interested in the history and characteristics of coins from different mint facilities. An official statement was released by the Privy Council Office on August 21st, 1968. The Minister of Finance reported that he had authorized the minting of 75 million 10 cent coins in the United States. This was necessary to alleviate a critical shortage of coins in Canada. 
the Canadian Mint was fully extended and making up the shortage of quarters and cannot meet the additional production requirements to provide an adequate quantity of 10 cent pieces. The cabinet noted the report of the Minister of Finance to the effect that he had authorized the minting of 75 million 10 cent pieces in the United States. And that is a quote from O.G. Stoner, Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet. O.G. Stoner, that is an interesting name. There are three separate mintage figures for the Canadian 1968 dimes. There's the Philadelphia, the Ottawa, and the Silver, which was only struck in the Ottawa facility. So first, there's 85,170,000 of the Philadelphia. There's 87,412,930 struck in Ottawa and 70,460,000 of the silver 1968 Canadian dimes. Some of the details and specifications for the 1968 Philadelphia. It is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 2.07 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.16 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Arnold Machen for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a diaxis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. Now, in terms of value, the 1968 Philadelphia Mint, if you can identify it, is actually a pretty interesting case because it is not as valuable on the low end as the Ottawa 1968 Canadian 10 cent coin. The silver, of course, you will get melt value for so it is probably the most valuable if you do happen to find one and it is beat up worn and been put through the meat grinder but if you want to get the maximum amount of money for a canadian 1968 dime you want to identify the philadelphia mint and hope for a high mint state example now if you can identify the philadelphia mint 1968 which will have shorter notches that are spread farther apart on the reading it can be worth all the way up to $425 for an MS66 example. I have actually found Canadian 1968 dimes composed of nickel that are in a high mint state. Maybe not MS67, but definitely pushing MS63 to MS65. So I don't doubt if you kept your eyes open, you can maybe find one of these, especially if you busted open a full uncirculated roll of 1968 Canadian dimes. I know there's got to be a few of them still out there, whether they're sitting in coin shops or maybe in the vaults of banks. So just to give you guys an idea in comparison, the 1968 that was struck at the Ottawa facility in Canada is worth around $61 for an MS66. So $425 for the Philadelphia and $61 for the Ottawa Mint. At the high end, it makes the Philadelphia Mint a lot more desirable and valuable and it's a pretty easy one to identify as well you just want to throw this under the microscope and inspect the reading now what do you guys think about these 1968 dimes what would you do if you ever found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins mentioned in this video let me know down in the comments i would love to know In the year 2021, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the iconic Blue Nose ship, the Royal Canadian Mint introduced a redesign for the Canadian 10 cent coin, featuring a new artistic rendition by Nova Scotia marine artist Yves Beroub. In a groundbreaking move, the Mint also released Canada's first ever colored dimes, incorporating a touch of blue to vividly portray the essence of the Blue Nose. The inspiration for this redesign actually traces back to the year 1937 when the Blue Nose ship, symbolizing a cherished national emblem for Canada, influenced the original design of the 10 cent coin during the reimagining of Canada's circulating coins. Marie LeMay, president and CEO of the Royal Canadian Mint, expressed enthusiasm about this historic occasion, emphasizing the enduring legacy of the Blue Nose in Canadian history. The Blue Nose was launched in March 1921 from Lunenburg Harbor and quickly gained fame as the swiftest fishing schooner worldwide. Not only did it secure a record catch on the Grand Banks in its inaugural season, but it also brought the International Fisherman's Trophy to Nova Scotia. The Blue Nose maintained an undefeated status in racing for almost two decades, earning the title Queen of the North Atlantic Fishing Fleet. Its international representation included notable appearances at events such as the Chicago World's Fair in 1933 
and His Majesty King George V's Silver Jubilee in 1935. Contrary to its name, the Blue Nose actually had a black and red hull with a yellow strip. The term Blue Nose had been a moniker for Nova Scotians since at least the year 1785. The coin's reverse was designed by Yves Baroub and showcases an angled view of the Blue Nose under a full sail and heeled to port on an open sea. This dynamic portrayal is available in both colored and uncolored versions, both of which bear the double-dated inscription 1921 to 2021. The colored version is groundbreaking for a 10 cent circulation coin, featuring blue highlights that represent the deep waters of the North Atlantic. The obverse side features the effigy of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Now, even though these commemorative design dimes from the year 2021 are incredibly revolutionary and beautiful, it is actually the single date plain design for the 2021 dime that you are looking for. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are actually four different designs for the 2021 dime. The first is the colored blue nose, then there is the uncolored commemorative blue nose design, then there is the double date, which will have the date of 1921 to 2021, and then there is the single date dime, which will only have the date of 2021, and that is the one that you want to look for. The mintage of a coin refers to the total number of copies produced, and it plays a crucial role in determining a coin's rarity and potential value in the collector's market. In the context of the four different designs for Canadian dimes in the year 2021, the regular design with a single date has a much lower mintage compared to the other three designs, making it more valuable and rare for several different reasons. Distribution and Circulation the regular design of a coin is often the one intended for general circulation, and these coins are distributed widely for everyday transactions. Usually special or commemorative designs will be produced in smaller quantities and may not be as widely circulated, but in the case of the single date 2021, it is actually the opposite. Collector interest. Collectors often show a keen interest in special or limited edition coin designs, leading to a higher demand for these coins. Usually the regular designs, being more common and part of everyday transactions, might not attract the same level of collector attention initially. But this is actually something that adds to the intrigue and allure of this single day 2021 as because it does not stand apart from any other Canadian dime in terms of its design, they can easily slip under the radar of normal coin muggles, I guess we will call them. Now, when I say coin muggle, I am not trying to say it in a derogatory sense, but basically it is a term that I will use for anyone that doesn't have any knowledge of numismatics and they might actually let a coin that is worth a lot of money go in an everyday transaction. That's why it is always good to arm yourself with a little bit of knowledge. That way you don't accidentally let a coin into circulation that is worth hundreds or thousands of dollars by mistake. Minting decisions. Mintage decisions are made by the mint and they're based on factors such as public demand, commemorative events, and overall coin production requirements. Regular designs are typically minted in larger quantities to meet the demands of daily commerce, while special designs may have limited mintages. Now my best guess when it comes to the 2021 single date dime is that the Canadian Mint didn't actually have a really good plan in 2021 for how they were going to roll out the commemorative dimes. They may have actually struck some of the single date dimes at the beginning and then when they eventually planned or introduced the double date dimes with the date of 1921 to 2021, they may have actually switched up and produced a larger quantity of those. And because they had already made a decent amount of the single dates initially, they just released them into circulation and gave them out to banks. A similar situation would probably be with the 1991 quarters that have a very low mintage of around 450,000. Marketing and promotion. Special designs are often actively marketed and promoted by the mint, generating additional interest and demand. Regular designs may not receive the same level of promotional effort, which actually probably made the 2021 single date fly under the radar a little bit. Due to these factors and its lower mintage, coupled with the potential lower initial collector interest, can contribute to its rarity and consequently its increased value among collectors over time. However, the actual rarity and value will depend on the coin's condition and also the collector landscape for that particular year. Now, some of the details and specifications for the 2021 single date Canadian dime, if any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not an authentic example. It is composed of 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and 2.5% nickel. 
It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Susanna Blunt and Suzanne Taylor for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and has a die axis and metal alignment, which is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now in terms of value, this is not a coin that you're going to get rich off of today. This is one that definitely has the potential to increase in value over time. And if you were to find one and it had any errors or anything special or notable about it, it may add to its value quite substantially. But it cannot be stated enough how rare these things are and how small your chances actually are of ever stumbling upon one of these in your pocket change. If you're a coin roll hunter, you might get lucky and find one of these every couple of boxes. But chances are you're going to have to search and search if you want to find one of these bad boys. Now in terms of value on the low end, it doesn't hold too much of a premium, but I would say you can probably get around a dollar for one of these, even if it's beat up, worn, and been put through the meat grinder. But the good news is it's a fairly recent dime, only two years old as I'm making this video. So chances are most of them are going to be in pretty good shape at this point still. But if you were able to find one and it scores at the high end of the Sheldon scale, so that is an MS67, you can get around $100 for this right now. Now it is by far the most rare and valuable of all the different 2021 dimes that you can find and I have no doubt that in 10 or 20 years, its value could easily increase tenfold. Now what do you guys think about these Canadian 2021 dimes? What would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins that I mentioned in this video? Let me know down in the comments, I would love to know. To begin this journey, let's step back to the year 2000. Wow! We're 570 meters up, you know. Whoa, maybe we're like the first people ever to be here. Actually, no. The First Nations were here before us. It says that this mountain was climbed during the construction of the... A train. Railway. Oh, and to open up the Great White North, this mountain was used as a landmark for... Airplane! Right. Say, so isn't it time for a snack? Yeah. This millennium, we have seen countless stories take shape, presenting the 1999 Millennium Souvenir Set from the Royal Canadian Mint. Twelve superb designs, the shining result of a nationwide contest. A unique collection, an unforgettable gift. Look, a sheep. A sheep? Good one, Dad. During this time, Canada was buzzing with excitement as the new millennium dawned and the Royal Canadian Mint decided to mark this historic occasion in a very special way. Enter the 2000p Canadian Dime. Now this dime features the exquisite depiction of the iconic Blue Nose Schooner on its reverse side. The Blue Nose is a symbol of Canadian maritime history, celebrated for its elegance and also its speed. The Blue Nose design was first introduced in the year 1937 and is still featured on the reverse of the 10 cent coins produced in Canada today. The Blue Nose design has become synonymous with Canadian identity and is beloved by collectors and Canadians alike. Its timeless beauty and significance make it a fitting tribute to the country's rich maritime heritage. Now the reason that this particular dime holds such a special place in Canadian numismatic history as it was one of the first dimes the Royal Canadian Mint used the P-Mint mark to denote production at the new facility in Winnipeg and also the composition change of Canadian coins. The introduction of the P-Mint mark or composition mark on the 2000p Canadian dime marked a significant milestone for the Royal Canadian Mint. It not only signified the growing role of the facility in Winnipeg, but also highlighted the shift in composition of Canadian coins. The new composition change for the Canadian coins involved transitioning from a primarily nickel-based alloy to a multi-ply plated steel core. This change was implemented to improve durability and reduce production costs. The inclusion of this P-Mint mark on the 2000p Canadian dimes serves as a visual representation of these advancements in both production and composition. Now you might be wondering, what is the big deal? What is it that makes this coin so valuable? Well, it's not just about the value, but it's also about the excitement of the hunt and also the incredible stories they carry that make these coins incredibly special. But here's where it gets interesting. The 2000p dimes aren't your ordinary coins. They were part of a fascinating experiment at the Canadian Mint. 
While the Canadian 2000P Nichols were released for circulation with a limited mintage of just under 5 million, the dimes and quarters with P mint marks or composition marks didn't make their debut officially for circulation until the year 2001. There was a test set issued by the mint in the year 1999 containing coins with the date 1999 and also P mint marks. However, no such set was released in the year 2000. So any 2000 P dimes or quarters that you come across with that P mint mark were either released by mistake or found their way into circulation through vending machine companies testing the new coins. The way that you can identify this 2000 P dime is to look for the P mint mark under the bust of Queen Elizabeth II on the obverse of the coin. The presence of this P mint mark on the 2000 dated Canadian dime adds to its rarity and collectability. It is only believed that a limited number of the 2000 P dimes were ever produced. It is unknown exactly how many of these made their way into the wilds of circulation but it is estimated that no more than 250 of these holy grail coins were ever produced. Now this P mint mark indicates that the coin is made of multiply plated steel which replaced the nickel and other compositions used before the year 2000. Now I'm sure you are all wondering about the value of this coin. Unlike the 1969 large date dime which I have covered in a previous video, these 2000 P dimes are considered heirs, however their scarcity and unique history make them a prized find for collectors. While these coins might not make you an instant millionaire, they can fetch you some pretty good money, especially if you were to find one of them in your pocket change. They are a true testament to Canada's ever evolving coinage journey. So the next time you come across a 2000 P Canadian dime in your change collection or coin roll hunting, remember it's not just a coin, it is also a piece of history. Now that we have discussed the story and how to identify this extremely rare coin, what do you say we get into some of the specifications and potential value if you were ever to discover one of these gems floating around in your pocket change or in one of your coin roll hunts. Some of the details and specifications for the Canadian 2000 P 10 cent coin. It is composed of multiply plated steel, which is 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and coated with 2.5% nickel. It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The artists who designed and engraved the coin, the obverse was designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran, and the reverse was engraved and designed by Emmanuel Hahn. The edge of the coin is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a die axis in metal alignment. So if you ever discover any of these, you definitely want to make sure that all of those specifications check out. You want to make sure the edge is readed, it is magnetic, and has the correct weight and also thickness and diameter. Now, if you do identify all of those factors in terms of value, Coins in Canada does not actually list low end values, but I will give you guys the North Central Coins estimate. If you were able to find a 2000 P Canadian dime and it scores at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale, so that is around an AG3, I estimate you can probably get anywhere from $25 to $50 for it. Somebody will probably want it to fill out their collection. And even if you took it down to your local coin shop, they will probably pay a little bit of money for it. You might be able to get around $100 for a fine and up to $300 for an AU50. Now, when you start getting into the MS territory, you see some pretty big jumps in terms of value for this coin. It can be worth around $588 for an MS60. It can be worth around $931 for an MS64. And this bad boy can be worth all the way up to $2,410 for an MS67 example. Now, just to give you an idea in terms of value, the 2000 Canadian dime without a P mint mark is only worth around 25 cents for an MS60. And the maximum value that you could get for one of these is around 50 to maybe $75 if it scored an MS66 or MS67. So the 2000 P is far rarer than the 2000 Canadian dime without the P mint mark. And you can definitely make some good money off off of one of these if you were able to score one. Some of the great things about a lot of the coins that I am mentioning in these videos is that it is unknown exactly how many of them were released for circulation, so you never actually know if you might have one hiding in your change jar right now. What do you guys think about the Canadian 2000 P dime? What would you do if you ever found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins mentioned in this video? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. So first, let's give you guys some information so you have some context on how this coin came into existence. 
In the year 1967, the rising price of silver forced a reduction in the silver content in Canadian 10 and 25 cent coins from 80% to 50% composition, although some coins were still minted in 80% during that year. 1967 and 1968 are considered transitional years for the amount of silver commonly used in Canadian coins and the composition was eventually changed to pure nickel in the year 1968 with around a third of the dimes and quarters being composed of 50% silver for that final year. The transition from silver to nickel composition in Canadian coins during the years 1967 and 1968 was a significant change in the country's currency. The shift marked a move towards a more cost-effective and durable material for coin production. This ultimately impacted the value and collectability of these coins for numismatists. This was a very experimental and tumultuous time at the Canadian Mint and there was also a very heavy workload as the full run of 1967 commemorative coins was no doubt a huge undertaking in the years prior and working during this time must have been a strain on Mint employees. To help relieve some of this pressure, some of the Canadian 10 cent coins produced in the year 1968 were actually struck at the Philadelphia Mint in the United States. These are distinguishable from the Canadian dimes by looking at the width of the grooves along the outside reading of the coin. The dimes struck in the United States will have wider and more squared notches and the Canadian dimes will be more narrow and angled. The Philadelphia dimes are considered to be the more rare of the two varieties, but neither the silver nor nickel 1968 dimes are exceptionally valuable. However, in the year 1969, a production mishap occurred during the creation of the Canadian dimes resulting in an error in the matrices. By mistake, a portion of the coins produced had the large date feature instead of the intended small date. Since multiple coins are struck simultaneously by various machines, a mixture of both large date and small date coins emerged. Presently, there are around 20 confirmed instances of these error coins, but it is believed that there are still around 20 to 30 out in circulation that remain undiscovered. To identify this coin, you have to look at the date on the reverse of the coin. I will show an example of what both the small and large dates look like, but what I highly suggest is that if you find a Canadian dime from the year 1968, hold on to it because the date on the 1968 dime was only struck in the large size and the size of the numerals was reduced the following year, or at least so we thought. So if you compare the size of the date on your 1969 dime and the size looks similar to the date on the 1968, then you may have yourself a holy grail coin. The examples of this coin that have been discovered are usually not in the greatest condition and at best are barely pushing mint state if you're ever to find a legitimate example of one of these and it's scored higher in the MS range, it could easily be one of the most valuable Canadian coins of all time. Though there are only few known examples, it is very rare that an actual estimate exists for the amount of holy grail coins that could still be found floating around in the wilds of circulation. And this is one where if you hunt dimes regularly, you can definitely validate the lack of other good stuff to look for. So now that we've given you some information on how this coin came into existence and how to identify it, what do you say we discuss the specifications and potential value? The specifications of the 1969 large date dime should be exactly the same as the 1969 small date except for the size of the numerals on the date. It is composed of 100% nickel, it has a weight of 2.07 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, a thickness of 1.16 millimeters. The obverse was designed by Arnold Mockin and Myron Cook. The reverse was designed by Emmanuel Hahn and Myron Cook. The edge of the coin is reeded, it is magnetic, and the die axis is in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian coins. So let's get into the values for the 1969 large date dime. First, just to give you an idea in comparison, the highest graded known example of the 1969 currently is an AU50, which is just before the MS mark. As I mentioned earlier, if you were to find one of these and it did score anywhere in the mid MS range, this would be an incredibly rare and valuable Canadian dime that could easily be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And one of the best things about this 1969 large date dime is it is not actually that old. I have found 1970 nickels, dimes, quarters, that are in a high mid state. So your chance of being able to find one of these and it's in decent condition 
aren't the worst ever. Hopefully someone didn't find one of these and bash it with a hammer not knowing what it is, but you never know. To find one of these, even at the absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale would be a nice little treat. So just to give you guys an idea of value, the 1969 small date can be worth up to 20 cents for an AU50, which is two times its face value. It can be worth a couple dollars when it starts to hit the MS region. It can be worth 10, 20 dollars when it starts to hit around an MS65. Now, when it comes to the 1969 large date, on the very bottom end of the Sheldon scale, it is worth $11,300 for an F12. So that is not the absolute bottom. The absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale is an about good or a good, which is a three or a four out of the 70 point system. But an F12 is still pretty low, not the greatest shape ever, that is for sure. And you're still getting over $10,000 for this dime. Now on the high end, one of the highest graded known examples is an AU50 and it can be worth around $21,000 $200 for an AU50 example. And as I mentioned earlier on, it is estimated that somewhere around 20 or 30 of these are still floating around in the wilds of circulation. So I suggest that you guys, if you have your piggy bags, you go bust it open, look through your dimes, because if you were to find one of these and it has been through the meat grinder, you can still make over $10,000. So definitely a good one to have on your radar and to keep your eyes out for, whether you're sifting through your pocket change or you are coin hunting. What do you guys think about the 1969 large date dime? How many do you think are still out there? And what would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you have ever found any coins similar to the one discussed in this video? Let me know down in the comments. During the year 1967, the rising price of silver forced a reduction in the silver content in Canadian 10 and 25 cent coins from 80% to 50%, although some coins were still minted in 80% during 1967. The two different compositions of the Canadian 1967 coins are not distinguishable by eye. 1967 and 1968 are transitional years for the amount of silver commonly used in Canadian coins and the composition was eventually changed to pure nickel in the year 1968 with around a third of the dimes and quarters being produced and composed of 50% silver for that final year. The transition from silver to nickel composition in Canadian coins during the years 1967 and 1968 was a significant change in the country's currency. This shift marked a move towards a more cost-effective and durable material for coin production ultimately impacting the value and collectability of these coins for numismatists. In the year 1967, the Canadian Mint made commemorative designs for each of the different denominations, and although they are incredibly beautiful and the dimes and quarters are silver, they usually aren't worth too much money. But believe it or not, there is an incredibly rare dime that has flown under the radar of most collectors, and it is found on the 1967 mackerel dime. In the year 1967, the Canadian Mint began preparations for the switch to the nickel composition for its coinage the following year. This was a very experimental time at the Canadian Mint and there was also a heavy workload as the full run of 1967 commemorative coinage was no doubt a huge undertaking at the time and some of the coins in the series such as the Rock Dove Penny had very large mintage figures so it would have definitely been a strain on mint employees. Now let's briefly discuss pattern or trial coins. Most pattern essays or trial coins were not officially approved for release but produced to evaluate a proposed coin design, a new or revised coinage, or to test the metal composition, dies, or structure of a new coin. And when it comes to pattern trial and essay coins, usually there will only be a few known examples of the piece, if any, and they usually don't leave the mint facility unless intended, and they are quickly snatched up, graded, and accounted for. I don't want to say that there's a 0% chance that you will ever stumble across one of these, in the wild but if you were it would definitely be a gift from the coin gods the thing that makes this coin great as opposed to some other errors and varieties is how easy it would be to identify silver coins are non-magnetic and nickel coins will stick to a magnet the thing that makes this 1967 mackerel trial piece so special is that it is actually composed of nickel instead of all the other mackerel dimes which were made of silver that year. This is most likely the result of experimentation by the Canadian Mint to test nickel planchettes, or maybe they planned on releasing some of the commemorative coins in nickel as well, but regardless, it's another great legendary coin to have on your radar. 
If you do ever happen to have a 1967 mackerel dime that appears like it may not be silver or has a more dull tone, all you have to do is hit it with a magnet and if it sticks, you have one of the rarest Canadian dimes in existence. Another identifying factor that makes this coin different from its silver counterparts is its weight. This nickel planchette pattern will weigh 2.1 grams and the silver mackerels should weigh 2.33 grams. There are actually a few other similar cases of coins where the Canadian mint will experiment and these holy grail pieces are born. One other good example would be the 1967 Bobcat Quarter, which is pretty much the exact same case as this dime. It was a pattern or trial piece struck on a nickel planchette and it can be worth some really good money as well. Some of the details and specifications for this coin, the overall mintage for the 1967 mackerel dime is 32,309,135. The trial pattern piece is composed of 99% nickel. It has a weight of 2.1 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters. It is magnetic. The face value is 10 cents and it is in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now that we've discussed some of the history and how to identify this coin, what do you say we get into the value of this extremely rare piece of Canadian numismatic history? If you were to ever send this coin in to be graded, it would be classified as a specimen and get an SP designation as that is the designation most Canadian pattern or trial coins will receive. So as I mentioned earlier on, there are only a few known examples currently for this coin. If you were to find one and it scored an SP63, it would be worth around $3,000. It can be worth around $4,000 for an SP64. And this bad boy can be worth all the way up to $5,000 for an SP65, which as far as I can tell is the highest graded known example currently. If you were to ever find one and it scored any higher, you would probably see some pretty big price jumps and I would not doubt that the price of this coin starts to double and if it hits around an SP67, it could easily be worth anywhere from 15 to $20,000. So even though there is not too many of these known to exist and very few of them probably left the mint facility, it is definitely still a good one to have on your radar. I have found 1967 Macro Dimes coin roll hunting and in my pocket change before, they are still out there in the wild and you can definitely fish them out if you keep your eyes open. What do you guys think about the 1967 pattern mackerel dime? What would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you have ever found any coins similar to the one discussed in this video, let me know down in the comments. Also, I would really appreciate if you guys would hit that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also hit that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new videos as they are being released. But I think that is pretty much going to do it for this one, folks. So thank you so, so much for watching, everybody. But until the next one, peace out and have a good one, y'all.